Good morning, good morning. I want to welcome everybody here this morning at Bethany Bible Church. I want to welcome all the family members. Thank you all for coming this morning. I do have a list of announcements. Uh, we want to welcome Ron and his wife back. They're here to visit with us once again. Also, uh, no first-time guests. Uh, I don't have any anniversaries or no birthdays. Any anniversaries, birthdays? No? Wait a minute. Is a birthday like Wednesday? Who? No. Oh, it, it's it's coming. It's Wednesday. Okay. I'm going to tell you, okay? It's Wednesday, beginning at midnight. If, the, if it's the Lord's will, okay, I'll be 68 years old. Young guy. By the grace of God, okay? By the grace of God. It's him and him alone. And uh, I don't feel it and start still until I start doing stuff, and then I, and I feel it. But um, I want to welcome you all. And that was uh, man, you guys made me mess up right here. Tonight's service, uh, Brother Rick's going to continue in Job chapter twelve, and it's called "God is Wise, Not You." Also, Wednesday evening. 6 p.m., prayer meeting, please. I want to encourage all of you to come out and pray with us. Thursday morning has already started, men and ladies. Men study upstairs with Brother Joe. Downstairs, the ladies, Arthur Pink. And the booklets, I think, might be all gone already. I'm not sure. Also, I want to make sure that you guys, re everybody knows what next Sunday is, right? Yes. Shared meal. This, this gives you as well as the ladies and gentlemen to make your best meal that you like and you want us to enjoy it. Can I put it like that? Yeah. Right? Okay. Well, I know they can, we got some good men in here that know how to cook. Also, uh, we got that out of the way. Next Sunday, shared meal, birthdays, uh, tonight's service. Okay. Uh, from this moment on, I want to thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, from this moment on, I'm going to give it to Brother Dave, I believe. Yes. Good morning. I'm one of the new I'm one of the new people on the uh, search committee, and just wanted to give you an update uh, of it. Yes, uh, Dave and I uh, went ahead and did rock, paper, for scissors, and I lost. Uh, so I got to be the one doing the announcement this morning. No, but uh, wanted to let you know where things were actually at. We met this last uh, Sunday to spend some time looking at where we are because actually this process has been in in the works for about over two years now. And so as we spent time talking and praying, one of the things that has been the outcome of that is we wanted to actually be a little more proactive uh, with the process of uh, searching for a pastor. Uh, but before I go into that area, first of all, I wanna thank uh, the men who have actually stood up to be up here to preach in this pulpit. And so Zach and Joe, you guys have just been absolutely wonderful in taking that time and, and devoting yourselves to continually keeping us in the Word of God. And so we're just so thankful that, for that. And it's just a, a blessing to see that constant work in the, of the Lord in your heart and lives. But uh, do be praying for the uh, steering committee or the uh, search committee as we move forward. We're actually uh, developing our job requirement description and the, uh, for the recruitment. And we're going to be working uh, to have that out on a couple of different uh, pastoral websites that we, uh, that we know of, uh, some good ones, and also to work with uh, Tim Challey uh, in the process of doing this. So do keep in, uh, in prayer for us as we complete that. We hope to have that uh, completed within a couple of weeks and uh, to move forward with that. So be praying for, uh, for wisdom and guidance as uh, the Lord would... Uh, and be praying for that individual that the Lord will be setting apart to, uh, to be our, our pastor in the, uh, the future. So thank you again. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We're going to begin this service with joining together with hymn number 15. And let's, let's stand with that and following that of us. David Dotson to come up and share scripture and prayer. So let's join in with our sacrifice of praise.
Well, good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from the second letter of Peter, verses 1 through 11. If you have your Bibles, uh, follow along with me. This is a, an interesting passage because Peter is exhorting the church to grow in Christian virtue. And he's giving some examples of what really that means. So hear the word of the Lord. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world of by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his justification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrances into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Let's pray. Oh, dear Father God, we thank you for the time, the day that you have given us of life. We thank you for this day that we have for worship and adoration. We bow before you, Lord, this morning in, hum hum in humility and in praise. We worship you. We glorify your name. We give you thanks for all the things that you provide, most of all, your grace and your mercy. I pray, Lord, that each one of us this morning will have a heart of worship. Pierce us today as you would have us know the message of the hour. Change us in the way that you would have us be. Continue to work in our lives, Lord. Instill us with your spirit every day, every moment, every second. We realize, Lord, that each of us is just one breath away from eternity. And we want every morning to be up with you and have a day dedicated to your service, to your holiness, and to your work. Thank you for this time, and in your holy name we pray, amen. Please be seated. This next hymn, first line begins with, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That hope is an assurance, a certainty, because it is based on Christ himself. Let's join in with Christ, the solid rock.
assurance of that. <clears throat> this next song is a relatively short one. Truly, we find peace of God, peace in God. He is our peace. <laughs> next one. Again, when we face trials, we do not have to worry about them. We know the Lord is with us. And we can rely upon him when trials come. Thank you. 
All right, good morning, church. We will be continuing our study of the book of Romans this morning. Uh, we will be beginning chapter 5. All right. So as we have been making our way through the book of Romans so far, again, as our kind of weekly recap that we're having to do quicker and quicker as we get further into this book. So this is a letter that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome. This is a church that Paul did not plant. He has not visited them. He hasn't spent time physically among them, but they are, they are well known to him and he, being one of the apostles, is well known to them as well. So with that, he is planning on visiting them. He's planning on having a visit as he passes through on a missionary journey. He hopes to spend time with them there, bearing fruit among them as they also bear fruit among him, in partnering with him as he continues that missionary journey, offering encouragement and support as he tries to make his way to the church in Spain. So with that, since this is a church he has not preached among, as he's preparing for his time with that he hopes to spend with them, he is making sure they are aware of the gospel that he preaches, that it is the gospel of the apostles and that it is the true gospel that was preached by Christ and prepared for in the Old Testament. That led him in the first, basically from chapters one to three and a half, uh, kind of breaking down like, okay, all men, whether Gentile or Jew, stand condemned in Christ Jesus. That there is no way through the law, through your own works, all men have rejected God in and of themselves. They don't seek God. They don't come after. They want nothing to do. They are wicked in their hearts and in their deeds. Which brought us to chapter 3, or the second half of chapter 3, where now he is saying that apart from the righteousness of the law, apart from the men working meritorious acts, they have been saved by the actions of Christ, by his life, his death, and his burial and resurrection. Eternal life, salvation, justification for sin has been found in the person of Jesus Christ, and we have access to that through faith. That that is how we come into this grace that God has poured out among us. That it is not the, our own actions, but rather it is the grace of God poured out on us, resulting in faith in him, and it is through faith that we gain that access. And he makes sure to make it clear in chapter 4 that this has always been the way that it was. That in the Old Testament, it wasn't that men there were saved during this Old Covenant period, that men weren't being saved by law then. They weren't saved because they had the law and were keeping it. They were even then being saved by faith through, or by grace through faith. And he uses Abraham as his prime example. He lifts up Abraham and says, see, look at now the father of the faithful, and that's who he is. He is the one we are imitating, those who are in Christ are imitating the faith that Abraham first had. And so even then, an Abraham who precedes the law and whose own uh, uh, justification precedes the giving of circumcision, Paul lifts him up and says, see, it's not the law and it's not the circumcision that saves you, and it never was, but rather that belief is accounted to men as righteousness. Now, we've kind of wrapped that up uh, with chapter 4. And that brings us here into chapter 5, and we're getting into a therefore here. So because of what's just stated, now this. So this morning, we plan on covering the first five verses of chapter 5. So if you guys will stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Hear the words of the living God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom, we all, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. 
And hope does not put to shame because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Thus says the words of the living God, and may he write it on our hearts by faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for the truths contained within them. May they conform us in further into the image of the Son here this morning. And may our hearts be turned to you in worship and affection as we dwell on the words preached here. Father, thank you for your church, for these people. May we be a blessing to one another, and may we glorify you when we exit this place. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So again, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, going back through everything we've talked about, having been justified by God, we have, or by faith, we have peace with God through Christ. So notice the assumption there that goes off. If you are having been justified by faith, Paul is assuming that in everything else he's about to lay before you right now. That you, in fact, you who are, who are to reap the encouragement of benefits following here is only those who have been justified. This is important because as we look at these, as what's coming on here, this conversation about peace with God and all that's been accomplished, there are those, such as the, ironically, as we've gone through this book, if we've brought this up a few times, the Roman Catholic Church has a real issue here. Because the Roman Catholic Church teaches that all men equally are, in fact, children of God. This, is a, this has been uh, promoted by their councils. They lift this up, and they look at every single person and say, you are a child of God. And the scriptures do not back up such a claim. That one, adoption, is for those who are in Christ. And not only that, but those who are outside of Christ are, in fact, not children of God, but enemies of God. That those who stand, and this is uh, Ephesians chapter 2, right? Like the wrath of God sits on your head. You are born a child of the wrath of God. Like that is your lot. That is your position. And that's what we've covered so far going through in Romans, right? When we were in that initial bad news section of those first few chapters, we had to, you know, confront the reality that we are born suppressing the truth of God in our, in our unrighteousness, in our sin. We reject him. We war against him. We hate the goodness that he is. We despise it and our actions show it and that the way we live our life is an attempt to destroy all knowledge of the true and living God that sits in the heavens. We do everything we can to corrupt that, going down to forms of self-mutilation uh, in the form of homosexuality and the like, to try to rid ourselves of even the concept of the image of God that we bear. That is where mankind stands. Mankind if, apart from Christ, has no peace with God. It is not found that you are at war outside of faith in Christ through which you have, may be justified. You are an enemy and at war with the true and living God, and what a fearful place to be. Look back at the Old Testament at what happened to the enemies of God. Right? Like if we're going to talk about Egypt right, and the ten plagues that are poured out upon them, and then the Hebrews come out, and then you have Hebrews who have been freed from Egypt, who they decide that generation, they want to be enemies of God too. They want to reject the good gifts of God. They want to war against him. They want to make golden calves, and God says, okay, fine. I will hate this generation. You can die in the wilderness. The next one will come in. And then that next generation comes in, and what, they come in to take possession of the land of Canaan. And what is Canaan full of? Enemies of God, who despise him, who worship idols, who sacrifice their children in bronze cows, committing horrific, horrific deeds. And God sends Israel in to do what? To lay waste. 
They are to drive the people out. They are to destroy the nations that are there. And then when Israel, later on, after they come in and take possession of the land of Canaan, where, you know, you have this moment, Solomon's dedicating the temple and saying, look, the promises of God for us. We have the land that he's given us. He's multiplied us like the stars. You see, this is, what a beautiful time we're in. And what do they do as time goes on? They seek after idols. They end up embracing the false religions and the false idols and the demonic worship of the people that were in Canaan, and they bring it into their place. It was funny. I was looking at this uh, archaeological dig. I forget how long ago it was now. But someone was like, oh, look, see, the Jews weren't actually monotheists. We just did this big dig in Israel, and we found so many idols. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, the Old Testament already told me about that. Like as if this is some disproving moment of like the Old Testament narrative. It's like, oh, you mean Israel was doing exactly what the Bible said they did? Like they, they embraced this wicked worship and these wicked practices and sacrificed their children on altars and offered worship to demons? Yeah, I, I know. I remember. Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and all these prophets, they told me about it. And so what does God do to them? He brings nations on their head, wicked nations that he says, these are going to be my tools, and I'm going to bring them like an ax, and I'm going to chop you down. And the, all through this, you have this picture of like, the time will come where God judges his enemies. If not in this life, then at the next judgment, they will in fact be judged. And all of those who are not in Christ uh, through faith, they stand in that place. You are an enemy of God, and that is a fearful place to be. Because everything I just, because we can look at all the judgments God poured out in the Old Testament, and they, are, and they are brutal judgments that he pours out righteously and good, and it is good that he does so. But nothing compares to the second judgment and the second death that is to come for all those who are enemies of God. And yet, the scripture tells us that for those of us who have been justified, we have peace with God. That that warring is over. That we who are in Christ, we have been brought into the place, and I think even going back to Solomon again and how in his time he was promised he was just gonna have peace on all sides. You know, his father was a man of war. He was going to spend his life. But now they're, you, you will have peace. You will build the temple. He was a man of war. I didn't let him do it. He was a man of bloodshed. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. It's not a condemnation of David that he was a man of war and bloodshed. It was exactly what God called him to do. Like he was to go out and wage war. And the wars he waged were good wars. Of course, he falls short at times, right? We all know the story of Uriah and Bathsheba. But he was still a good man. But in come Solomon time, he says, I will give you peace. It's even told to Israel as they, come, as they are going in, what is told to the generation that's going to die in the wilderness prior to entering Canaan? You will not enter my rest. You will not have this peace. And it's just, I mean, and really, like, take a second, and I even think back to times where I remember I was looking back a, uh, as I was getting ready for this, I was reading some of R.C. Sproul's comments, and he was talking about the moment as a child where he was playing pickleball in this, or stickball in the street, and he's out there, and all of a sudden a bunch of people come running out, and they're celebrating in the streets, and he's annoyed because his at bat just got ruined in this stickball game. Well, what it comes to find out is it was VJ Day. It was, you know, it was uh, the victory of Japan in World War II had just been a comp, like they, uh, Japan had surrendered. And, there was this, and for him, it meant his dad was coming home because his dad was fighting in World War II. And he got kind of this moment of like, oh, it's done. Like this moment, all this, blood, all this warring that's been going on, it's done. I've now found peace. And peace always comes by Christ conquering his enemies always comes by conquering his enemies. And it, conquering the enemies happens in one of two ways. One is it's like when Israel goes into Canaan and he, just, and he just drives them out. And it is that brutal judgment poured out on their heads. But the other way that God conquers his enemies 
is all of those who are in Christ sitting here today. That by like, I am a conquered enemy of Christ who is now, now in Christ, who is now an adopted son and a co-heir. I stand where I am because by grace, God conquered me. And, I've been, and now I get to be a partaker of the benefits of that peace. That when I come into the presence of God, it's while there's still going to be, and it's to be clear here, I still have enemies. Like my life of war is not yet over. It's just God is no longer my enemy. I now war against principalities and powers that try to raise itself against the truth of God. Those are the enemies, and I com- those are the enemies I combat through the preaching of the word and through the gospel preached, through defending and tearing down every wicked, thought, wicked thing that exalts itself against Christ. Like, those are my enemies, but God is not. I have peace there. I have the peace where it matters. I have the promise of Eden in me that there will be Peace one day, not just in the way I have it now with, in, with God, but I will have peace on all sides one day like Solomon did. This, for all those who have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ. Verse 2, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, my translation here, I'm using the Legacy Standard Bible. It uses the term there that we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace. Um, I prefer a lot of other translations, actually. And this is one of the rare cases where I actually really prefer other translations, the way they render it versus the LSB here. Um, oftentimes you'll see access. Many of you who are using other translations right now probably see we have gained access into this grace. I think that's a better, uh, a better rendering of what we have here. And as we take note of that, like as we have access by faith into this grace, understand that even in Paul, what kind of imagery this would be provoking for him. Right, Because even when you get to the author of Hebrews, and he's talking about that we can boldly draw near to the throne of God, that we have access to God in this way, this is something realized unique to compared to what the people had in the Old Testament. Right? Remember the tabernacle and the temple where you have this set up and you kind of have this, but you have inside of all of it, as much as you can draw near, there's always this layer. It's like, but you can't go past here. This is where it stops. You don't have access. You can't come into the Holy of Holies except for the high priest. The high priest is the only one who has access, and even he has to go through an an intense amount of cleansing ritual before he's allowed to set foot. And it's like only for a little bit, like get in and get, do what you got to do and get out. There's some tradition that claims, this isn't really a verifiable historic, we don't know for sure this is true, but there is some Jewish tradition that claims like, that they used to tie a cowbell and a rope around the priest's ankle so that if he went into the, there and died, they could pull him out. Like, it's like, oh, well, you know, because we're not, because we aren't going in there. Like, we're, we're not allowed into this place. That's too far. Even the veil and this thick piece of linen that was there just as this barrier of don't go past here. You don't have access. And this really was the significance, and many of you are very familiar with it, when Christ dies, right, and it says from top to bottom, the veil in the temple is torn. Because here the change takes place, that by the death of Christ, men now, by, by grace, through faith, actually have access. They're able to be brought in. They're brought into the grace of God. They're brought into just faith. And that is the place where they stand now. That you can enter into the presence of God and not be utterly destroyed. Like you have the ability to draw near to the throne of God. To be in his presence. And this is something I think we take, because we throw around the term a lot, you know, as believers in the modern day of being in the presence of God. And I think we talk about this term far too lightly. 
Like we don't understand the significance because we didn't have the temple. We didn't see the barrier ourselves. We didn't have the moment of saying, no, no, no further. We have been, you know, come to Christ and have known God in a time where that access has always been made available. And it is good for us to look back and remember, oh, this was an accomplishment. This isn't something that man has a right to. This isn't something where it's like, no, men just get to go before God. Like, no, only by the shed blood of the God-man and only by laying hold of that by grace through faith can you have this kind of access to that grace. And in that grace, you now stand positionally somewhere where you could not before. Right? As Paul says here, you stand in this grace that in your justification, you have been made not only as if you've never sinned, but you have had the active obedience of Christ credited to you. You have now have all the righteous works that Christ did credited to your account. And so you are able to stand in this place based off the merits of Christ. And now you have a standing of which you could not have yourself. Now again, remember that this, uh, this grace that we have access to by faith is the same faith that we've covered in the previous chapter. It's the one that Abraham had. Don't lose sight of that. Don't lose sight of that as of what we've talked about previously as we're coming into here. It's the same faith. It's the same grace, again, just pointed in different directions. Abraham looked forward. We look back. But that is what we're having our faith in. And then wrapping up that verse, it says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Um, some translations will render that rejoicing. Uh, mix it all up together. Rejoice, the word there, if your translation says rejoicing, it's not typically the word in the New Testament that's translated that way. Normally that word is translated as boasting. But take, like, take heed to that, like wrap all of these concepts up and lift it up high that we rejoice and we exult and we boast about the hope of that we have in the glory of God. That we see the glory of God manifested in what he did at Calvary 2,000 years ago. We see it manifested in his people being conformed into the image of Christ more and more. And we look forward in hope to the fact that the glory of God will pour, fo pour forth in its full magnificence throughout the entirety of the cosmos one day. That the glory of God and all, it, it, it will be revealed in a way in which it is not quite yet, where we see hints of it. But we also know its magnificence because he's still shown us at times the magnificence of that glory. And we hope in the fact that one day, It'll pour through every crevice of creation. That there will be no point, even as now men try to suppress that truth, and at times we even as believers have a hard time of laying hold of it everywhere, it will be there. That, that is what we are hoping in. In the magnificence and beauty and wonder of our God and all that it is, has and is going to accomplish in this creation. Now moving on to verse 3. And not only this, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction brings about perseverance. Now I do want to, uh, I want to make one note here just as we get into this as we're talking about affliction because we're going to talk about how we need to be rejoicing in our afflictions. But sometimes when this topic comes up, I think you end up making the mistake that I believe someone like David Platt makes in his book, Radical, uh, where you get, start wading into these waters of what some people have called the poverty gospel. So like in 
opposition to the prosperity gospel where it's like, hey, if you just believe in Jesus, you're going to be rich and you're going to be wealthy and like all these things, and that's how you'll know you're truly in Christ. There's at times a poverty gospel where it's like, hey, unless you're dirt poor and like everyone hates you and you're actively being like horrifically persecuted, you're probably not in Christ. And that's just not a biblical position that you can, re- like it's just not a place you can rest in looking at the scriptures. And this happens, and we, what we need to understand is, one, yes, Christian, you will have affliction in your life. But there are degrees and levels of affliction that God pours out to different people at different times. Like Christians in the United States 200 years ago weren't suffering heavy persecution all the time. Amen? Like they weren't under threat for their life constantly. They weren't having, like this wasn't a part of their day. They lived in a place where generally speaking, they had peace from these kinds of things. Now, does that mean that they were empty of affliction? No. No, of course it doesn't. I was just talking with uh, Joe and uh, Dave this morning as we were kind of, as I was getting ready for this, one of the things that crossed my mind, now we got to go to England in the 1600s, but talking about John Owen. And there were, was persecutions going on at this time, but it wasn't quite like what you had at other points during church history, say the first and second century church with Rome and everything. But John Owen doesn't spend time in prison. He's this Puritan. He doesn't have the, those kinds of persecutions going on along, around him. But he did have 11 children, 10 of whom died in childhood, and the 11th died at 21. The only child to make it to adulthood dies at 21. That is affliction. Right? Like that is, and that's the reality of sin, living in a world of sin and death that even in the best place it is to be for a Christian, these things are still going to bear its consequences in our lives. Like even you Christian today, we can talk about all the issues going on in our country. You still got it pretty good. Like no one's coming through these doors right now to arrest us yet. Like, and for most of, it, like most of you here, you have grown up in such a way where any time you've spent in church, that's been your reality. You were able to confidently come here. And so affliction doesn't always have to look like you're being fed to the lions. That may not be what God has allotted for you. That kind of specific kind of suffering, that specific kind of affliction may not be laid out for your life. And yet... You live in a fallen world with sin and death. There will be affliction. In fact, even if I may, on a personal level, ask for you guys' prayers as a quick aside a second. Last night, uh, you know, my Aunt Denise has been coming here lately. Last night, her husband is visiting their kids up in Seattle. He was in the ER, and he got diagnosed with uh, stomach cancer last night with some pain. They found a golf ball-sized tumor, and they're kind of going about what their options are. And so, you know, if you guys can pray for them as they're entering into a moment of affliction as a family, you know, my family, his wife, you know, his, his kids, like they're going to be coming into a, a hard season coming up here, a time of affliction. Um, and it's because we live in a fallen world. And yet him, and he is a believer, um, He's still also, he's never, like, again, and he grew, and they're, by the way, he's Samoan. They live in Samoa. That's, like, where they live. She's just out here, like, she comes out for about a month at a time. He comes out sometimes with her. Like, they actually endure some kind of spiritual warfare. There is a lot of, like, native religion, witchcraft stuff that goes on down there. And yet even he, up until this point, like, hardships, yes, not this massive persecution. And yet let's not make light of this serious affliction that someone now is going in with something like that right? Like, this is a difficult time. And so while, and basically, all of this is to say, don't start judging whether or not you're truly a Christian based off whether or not you're being fed to lions. Don't judge the fact whether you're faithful because someone else got allotted in his sovereignty to go through a heavier persecution and affliction than you have. He's allotted afflictions to you. You will go through them. But let's not do this thing where, and again, some people trying to actively bring themselves into affliction to try to prove that they are more Christian or they're better, they really are Christians. 
and rather just trust in the sovereignty of God as he brings all these things about. You guys get what I'm saying here? All this makes sense, right? We're not a poverty gospel people. We are a people who worship God, know him as the giver of good gifts, and sometimes those good gifts also include the afflictions. And in those, in the same way we boast in our hope in the glory of God, we can now boast in these afflictions. And I want to make something really clear here about why you can boast in those afflictions. Because God is sovereign. Because God is sovereign, you can boast in your afflictions because your afflictions are not an accident. I've brought up R.C. Sproul once already. Remember, as Sproul said, there is not a stray atom in the universe. There's nowhere out there where something isn't doing exactly what God intends it to be doing. His hand is over all of it, accomplishing his purposes. So when affliction comes your way, you can trust that it's from the sovereign hand of God. That it's actually something to boast in because he's doing something. He is working something out in you, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. But again, as Abraham Kuyper said, there's not one square inch of the universe where the Lord Jesus Christ does not cry out, mine. Like, it's mine. I do with it what I please. And this becomes the issue when everyone wants to start kicking against the sovereignty of God and they want to start trying to make a a bigger deal than I'd say the scriptures make about human free will. And you almost end up in this position where people start talking about like, well, bad things happen because bad, you know, people make free will choices and they're bad things. As if God's sitting there with it, tying his own hands behind his back like, sorry, I wish I could do something, but you know, human free will, I have to, you know, I have to answer to it. Like as if, he's in sub- as if God is subject to the will of man. And it's this weird perversion. And it's a, oftentimes it's an attempt to try to, you know, make, they're like, well, doesn't this make God culpable? It's like, well, what do you mean by that? Is God in sin because he does, he's the potter and we're the clay and he does with his creation what he pleases? No, God is performing no wickedness, but it is from his hand. He, he does bring all things to pass. He decreed all these things from the beginning, from before the foundations of the world. And because of that, Christian, you can boast and trust in them because it comes from the hand of your Father who's in heaven. That is why you can take comfort and boast in these things. Not because they're a cosmic accident, there are none, but because your good Father in heaven brought them to you. And why? Well, while I may not be able to answer every specific about why God brings about afflictions here, I can give you a couple, you know, overview points here of like, this is generally why. One is it brings about perseverance. Affliction brings about, in the, for those who are in Christ, perseverance. Now, Paul oftentimes uses athletics in the New Testament to kind of like, you know, run in a race, sports, all these kinds of things to like make these spiritual points, right? So let me take a page out of his playbook. If you are going to do something like play sports, or exercise, lift weights, run, whatever it's going to be, it's going to hurt. Right? Like, I don't, like, if you've ever, you know, done anything, if you played sports growing up as a kid, if you played football, if you ran, you know, cross country, long distances, if you played, you know, did I, did I say lifting weights or football? I said one of the two. Whatever it is, like, pain is involved here. Like, it's not comfortable. It's not like, I mean, having grown up here and playing sports my whole life, especially football, I remember getting ready for football season. I remember football, you know, not only all the off-season summer workouts where it's in the weight room and then going doing seven seven on sevens down on the field, but I also remember that when that first week of, you know, uh, or excuse me, we started, you would start football practice a week before school started. And there we were in 15 pounds of football gear, and out here in Havasu, it's 110 degrees outside. And it's like, now, this this is the most brutal couple weeks of the season. We're going to run you ragged and run you into each other over and over and over again. And that's what they did. And it's brutal. Like, it was hard. Like, you know, you're 16 years old. Like, okay, I guess I'm flirting with a heat stroke. You know, we'll see what happens here. But all of it was, it was an, the, the whole point, right, is you were being prepared to do something later. 
your coach in that sense is preparing for you like, hey, the time might come where it's fourth down and we're on the five yard line and we need to score and you just gotta be able to toughen up and do what you have to do to win a game. Like, you're, like we're, we're preparing you for what you're going to have to do later for what you're gonna be asked to do, for what you're gonna be called on to do. You're gonna have tasks that you have to perform. It's gonna be your job, and you're gonna have to lay your body on the line, and you need to get ready to do that now. When, so Christian, when the afflictions come, God is preparing you for something. And he's giving you, he's building up endurance perseverance. He's strengthening you that when life goes on and afflictions come and it's time to fight and it's time to wage war and it's time to do all these things, you are being prepared by the afflictions now for what you will have to do later. God is building up that kind of strength in you. And it's not, and like we don't boast in it because it's pleasurable, right? We're not masochists. We're not sitting here like, yeah, I just love the pain. Like, that's not the point here. The point is, no, I'm preparing myself for something later. I'm looking forward to the result of these things, of the perseverance that I'm going to have, and that's what I'm boasting in, in what God is going to accomplish through all of it. It's the same way where Christ... uh, Uh, counted it joy to go to the cross, not because he wanted to hang on the cross. The joy of Christ in the cross was not that he was going to suffer the wrath of God for three hours hanging there on Calvary. It was what was to come and what was to be gained and accomplished by the cross. That was the joy that Christ had, and that's why he went. He looked forward to that in joy. And Christians, so when you go through afflictions and that perseverance, you can boast and rejoice in it because you are looking forward to what a God is going to accomplish in these things, even if you don't know the specifics right now. You don't know exactly what it is you're going to be asked of later, but it's going to come and you are being made right, and you are made in, being made the kind of person who can endure all things through Christ who strengthens you from this momentary affliction you have now, and it is momentary. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, it holds no weight compared to the glory that is ahead of us. In com- the, what, the things we suffer now are infinitely small in comparison to the glory that we are being prepared for one day. Like there is something greater ahead of us. And so this affliction, these afflictions, we know that they bring about perseverance. And perseverance, verse 4, proven character and proven character hope. When, you, when this affliction brings about this endurance in you, when it forces you to learn how to persevere. And by the way, remember, this is for those who are in Christ, no one else. These things break those outside of Christ when it really comes down to it. But for you, Christian, this brings about a proven in character. That God is exposing who you are. As we've gone through the last, we talked about Abraham, right? Let's talk about one of Abraham's afflictions. We've talked about one of Abraham's afflictions, right? Take Isaac up the mountain, put him on an altar, and sacrifice him. And what does James say? That this act, that Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his own son justifies him. It justifies him in the sense that it shows the truth of his faith. It shows the truth of his character in Christ. We can look back and we know that what Abraham had wasn't just a lip service faith. It was the kind of faith that resulted in the way, in every aspect of how he lived his life. To the point of saying, yes, God, I'll sacrifice my son, trusting that he would even raise him from the dead, that the promises to Abraham would be kept. Abraham's character was proven in that affliction. And how many others through the history of the church have shown themselves faithful and true, men, of pro- men and women of proven character as they endured the afflictions of this life and they endured them and persevered in the way that God calls us to. It shapes us, it forms us. 
and proven character, hope. And this, this proving of the character does result in hope because, again, it's as I've quoted from Paul in other places before, he who began a good, uh, good work in us will be faithful and just to complete it. That what he started, he's not going to go, eh, I'm done with you after all, and then send you on your way. But for all those who are given, for the Father gives to the Son, he will lose none of them, and he will bring about this perseverance in you. And in that, you can hope that all those promises up until the resurrection on that great and glorious day are true. You have hope that God is continuing the work that he will one day complete. That he, not because we are faithful, but because he is faithful. In verse 5, and hope does not put to shame because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. I think it's good to offer a definition of a hope right here. Uh, Because I don't mean hope in the way that I hope the Cardinals win their football game today. Because one, I'm probably going to be let down. Though they surprised me last week. Um, Like not in that kind of hope where it's like, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Like I hope this works out. Like that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about New Testament biblical hope. We're talking about an assured hope, a confidence in that which is going to take place. Uh, R.C. Sproul put it as, hope is faith looking forward. Our hope, again, being that because of what has taken place and the faith we have there, our hope and our assurance that God will, going forward, complete all that he said he was going to. That he will accomplish all these things. And as we have like this hope, This hope does not put to shame because this hope in Christ will not let you down. It will not fail you. May God be true and every man a liar. It doesn't matter. God is faithful and that you can hope in. And that hope, we see it, uh, we can see it and look at it because the love of God has been poured out. I'm not talking about God making you loving I'm saying that the love of God has been poured into you to the point of overflowing. That his favor rests upon you. And in that, you cannot, you know you will not be put to shame, Christian. That the Holy Spirit is working in us, in the love of God, drawing us closer to the Father, justifying, applying the finished work of Christ to you. And in that, all of the assurance comes together. This work that God is rendering. So if I was going to close this out right now, if I have another hour to go. If I'm going to close out this section, it is one that in spite of whatever circumstances you find yourself in today, the hope that God has given to us for the future should not be despised. We don't look at the present circumstance and go, well, God can't accomplish what he said he's going to. Of course he will. And in fact, any kind of affliction you have today is just further proof And it's just further development of God fulfilling all of those promises for his people. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the book of Romans and the weightiness of this book and the encouragement that it brings about in your people. May we be instructed by it. Father, anything that was said here from you, uh, said here this morning, that rightly represents you. May it take root in our hearts. May it conform us in the image of your son. But if anything was said here, Lord, that doesn't represent you well, may it be forgotten and cast aside. Lord, may we be the people who boldly go forward, proclaiming your name, faithful to what 
you've called us to do in spite of anything that goes on around us. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This next hymn we'll be closing with, it's hymn number 343, Like a River Glorious, taken from some lines in Isaiah, for those that stay their hearts on the Lord Jehovah, they will find peace. Let's stand with hymn number 343, Like a River Glorious. our hearts as our our focus upon you Lord our trust our hope that assurance Lord because it is not based on something that would fail us Lord but it is based upon who you are your faithfulness and as we leave this place today Lord may that guide and direct us as we interact with others as we witness, as we share the Lord, may it be based upon our assurance, our trust in you. Lord, we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>